This morning we're going to talk a little bit about, or I guess it could be the afternoon for you, it could be night, it could be any time you're watching this, right? We're going to talk about sex roles or gender behavior. And I want to first give you a classic study by Margaret Mead, one of the most famous anthropologists of all time, very impressive intellect, that has done more field research than anybody, male or female, probably even since that time, even though she's, she's long since gone. And I want to compare that then with a new view that's coming out of sociobiology or evolutionary psychology, because we're really getting some radical different views here. You might be surprised in a college course that we don't have easy pat answers to some of these complex questions. And the reality is, is that we're constantly investigating. We know more now than we did five years ago, and in five years we'll know even more. I'll tell you the current state of knowledge that we have. One of the things that Margaret Mead was interested in, uh, being a woman growing up in America, and someone who not only went to college uh, in the early part of the 1900s, but went to uh, graduate school and got a PhD and became very famous, was she noticed, of course, that we had some gender stereotypes about what women should do and should not do, what men should do and should not do. And many people assumed that these were just natural, given by God or defined by biology or something of that nature, and she really kind of chafed under that. She studied under a famous anthropologist named Franz Boas, and one of her early studies was a study of gender behavior, and it comes from uh, a book called Sex and Temperament in Three Primitive Societies. Her mentor, Franz Boas, was the, one of the first ones to come up with this idea of cultural relativity that we talked about on an earlier tape. Her name is Margaret Mead. And she went to New Guinea, a small area that's highly mountainous, has lots of rivers, surrounded by ocean. And there are tribes there because it's so mountainous that are a few miles apart that have never even heard of each other and whose behaviors are radically different one from the other. And so she looked at three different groups and what she reasoned was is that if all three groups had relatively similar sex role expectations of men and women and they were similar to the United States, then what would be the cause? Well, probably biology. But if she found that there were radically different sets of gender expectations in New Guinea that differed not only from each other but from America, then she reasoned maybe culture was one of the major, the major input into how women behave and how men behave. So let's take a look at those three societies. One, the first one is the Irapesh. Now keep in mind she's doing a method of research here that we call participant observation. It's a fantastic method of research, but it's unfortunately the most open to bias and political correctness and things of that nature, so you have to be careful. It's great for generating hypotheses that you can test in other ways. Uh, and it's also great for getting information you can't get through a survey or an experiment, too. But it's also sometimes uh, open to bias. The Arapesh were a group of people where both the male and female were taught to be gentle. They did everything they could to socialize the men and women in being gentle to the extent they had no word for rape in their vocabulary. In fact, she had an almost impossible time explaining the possibility that a man or a woman could force himself or herself on another person. The only way that sex occurred was by the consent of two loving adults, according to, to their particular culture. Now, when they had sex, and this is rather curious, when they had sex, they saw it as creating a future child, that each time that this husband and wife made love, that they were, it's kind of a romantic idea here, that they were creating a child in the womb of the mother, and later that baby would give birth. And they, they, discouraged, uh, uh, they discouraged aggressiveness in any form. Now, they did recognize that little boys tend to be more active, just as our research recently has shown, tend to be more aggressive on some levels, but they did everything they could to kind of discourage that sort of stuff. Now, when it came to uh, creating the child, the male and female were equally involved. When it came to raising the child, m mom and dad were both very much involved in kind of gently raising, gently raising this child to, to be a good adult. Uh, but even at the time of birth, something strange happened. They weren't a scientific-based society. They didn't understand germs and, and trauma and things of that nature, but they did know that lots of mothers died in New Guinea in their tribe during childbirth. They knew that lots of babies died in their tribe during childbirth. And so their explanation was that there is this world of good and evil, 
and that there were evil spirits that were attacking the mother and the child. It was for jealousy from other people, bad omens from other tribes, all kinds of things happening. And so the father went through what's called a kuvad. Now the mother would uh, give birth. She'd be back in the field in a couple of days. And the father, however, would give birth in another part of the village. He would be demon-possessed, attacked by all these evil spirits, so it was great psychological stress on him. And we know psychological stress creates real physical stress. And so he would often be uh, away from his work for a lot longer period of time than the wife. Now the whole idea was that he loved his wife and child so much that he's trying to draw these evil spirits away and save their lives. They would make comments in this society about a man that had several children, such as, uh, you know, you should have, he's really handsome now, but you should have seen him before he had six kids. You know, kind of like the joke that, or the statement we might make about a woman. Uh, so not only do, during childbirth and during child rearing did they try to raise children gently and equally, uh, but the father got involved in the childbirth as well. Okay? Now, so those roles were alike or different from the United States? Yeah, fairly different. So what are our ideas of cultures being backed up here? The next group were the Mandugamor. And the Mandugamor were both very harsh, violent, certainly had a concept of the word rape in their vocabulary, and what we might call just rough sex was really quite common among these people. And I always think it's kind of funny when I'm trying to reread this book, trying to figure out between the lines how Margaret Mead got a lot of this inside information. You know, how much, uh, how much involved did she get in participating in this culture? Well, at any rate, uh, men and women were considered very strong and very aggressive. Male and female, both very aggressive. Now, a woman is about a third less strong in upper body strength than a man, but in that society, this was compensated for by weapons. If a man was beating his wife, the wife would simply uh, lay in wait and wait till he was asleep and wait till he wasn't looking, and she had a crocodile jaw. And a crocodile jaw is a nice farmable weapon, something like this, and she would wait till he wasn't looking and just clop him upside the head with it. And that kind of equaled her, you know, equaled his larger weight and strength oftentimes. Now, when they were dating, something was interesting as well. In the Mandugamore society, everybody was taught that you did not have sex before marriage. But the reality was everybody was having sex before marriage. The parents had had sex, the grandparents had had sex, and they're all kind of keeping the charade up saying, oh, nobody ever does that kind of stuff. And so the kids would often sneak off to try to, to get involved in some way away from the village. If you look at the Mandugamore society, the... the uh, uh, the boy, for example, oftentimes would go get, get water, get fresh water from a stream because they lived right on the ocean. And he'd have to go get it with a crock and carry water back. If a young lady was interested in him, she might lay in wait. And as he passed, she might jump up and hit him with a crocodile jaw, knock him down. If she really wanted to show her love and, and attention and, and amor, she would grab him, hit him, dig her fingernails into him. If she could draw blood, that really showed that she was excited about this guy and the same for him to her. So now they're, they're making love, they finish, and they've got to go back to the village. You know, he's got a broken, broken crock that he's carrying things in, she's got ripped clothes, he's got ripped clothes, you know, there's bleeding, and they've got to go back and make this great story about you know, they're wandering along and something jumped out and tripped them and they fell out of a tree and all this stuff. And, and the parents are sitting there nodding yes, like they really believe it, and they know exactly what's happened. Early on, the young boys and girls, as they reach puberty, start having multiple sex partners. And then they start narrowing it down, narrowing it down until they find someone they really care about. Now, I mentioned these people lived on the edge of the ocean, and the girls would frequently have their own separate hut from the family once they reached puberty. And this was right on the ocean during high tide, the water literally might be under it, and during low tide it might just be dry ground. But they would enter these huts from underneath. When the young lady and a young man had uh, kind of narrowed down their love interests to one another, he'd sneak over in the middle of the night, come up under the, the uh, house, and they'd make love in a hammock. And they just have a hell of a time. They're trying to keep each other quiet, because remember, they're pretty noisy, maybe having rough sex and all this good stuff. And then uh, he'd sneak off. And if, if they're really hitting it off well, and they really think this is the one for me, he's sneaking back the next night. He's sneaking back. And then one night, he falls asleep. And he wakes up just in time to escape before sunrise. And he's taken more and more chances. And then one night, finally, he falls asleep naked in the arms of his lover in this hammock. 
and the mother-in-law wakes him up, and she's angry. She starts hitting him, she grabs his hair, she pulls his ears, she kicks him, she knocks him out of the hammock, she throws him down out of the hut. That's the marriage ceremony. He's married. The tension between the mother-in-law and the son-in-law continues for the whole relationship, particularly early on. He has to hoe his mother-in-law's garden. She tells him what a lousy job he's doing at it. In this particular society, the men and women argue a great deal. The males and females like to argue. They get in knockdown, drag out fights in their families. An example of this is that the men were afraid for their wives to get pregnant because they might give birth to a little boy. That seems odd. The women were afraid to get pregnant because they might give birth to a little girl. Kind of the reverse of some of our stereotypes of a first child that male and female want. Well, what the deal was, the men, all of the little girls who were pre-puberty would be on his side in these family knockdown drag out fights. The mother, all of the little boys who were pre-puberty would be on her side. So you've got this army of mom, mom and all the little boys, dad and all the little girls just beating the crap out of each other. So you, you really were, were questioning whether you wanted someone to get pregnant or not. So if you look at these roles, of course, how do they fit with American society? Maybe Jerry Springer, but for most of American society, it doesn't fit what the stereotype was of how males and females behave. Let's look at the third and final type of, of society. And this was the chum bully. The chum bully were a group of people who basically had sex roles of the 1950s in the United States reversed. The males were considered gentle. If I could spell here. Try that again. Considered gentle. And they were interested in art, religion, and ceremony. To the point that the men would wear uh, elaborate costumes, which isn't unusual at all in pre-industrial societies, but one of the things they really liked was bird of paradise feathers. These real fancy, ornate feathers that are just lovely and flowing, and they put them in their hair and put them in their garments. And, and the women dressed very plainly. They didn't wear ornamentation, they wore almost no jewelry, they didn't wear paint on their faces, uh, and they didn't gossip. In fact, the men were the ones who were supposed to be the gossips. Now, maybe the women gossiped as well, but Margaret said that the men's, men were the ones who had the stereotype of being the gossip of the family. So if you look at the chum bully, this is like the reverse of the 1950s stereotype of American male-female behavior. And so she looks at all these three types of societies, the Arapesh, where the males and females were taught to be gentle, the Mandugamore, where the males and females were both thought to be very uh, sexually aggressive and aggressive in general. And the Chambuli, which had reversed our roles, what conclusion does she come to? Is it biology or is it culture? She concludes, of course, that these are so different that the vast majority of what determines our male-female behavior must be cultural in nature, must be part of what we learn. That's been the standard social science model from then to the present time. Uh, about the 1970s, some research started to occur in evolutionary psychology in an area called sociobiology that started to bring question into some of this. And I'll give you a real quick overview. It actually also begins to form some of the basis of what may explain eventually some of, homo of uh, homosexual behavior from a biological point of view. But let's just focus on males here. In fact, we know more about males right now than we do about, about uh, females, and particularly in homosexuality. If you have an XY male with a TDF, which is testosterone determining factor, uh, and you look at the brain's fetal development, they, they notice first of all that when cities like Dresden in Europe were firebombed and people were under tremendous stress, that women who were in the first trimester of pregnancy tended to give birth to a larger percentage of boys who became homosexuals as adults than, than otherwise. Not all of them, but just a higher percent. And they started reasoning what's going on. Well, what they figured was that the stress uh, affected the hormone levels in the fetal brain development quite dramatically. So they started doing experiments. Now, can we do such experiments on human beings? Not really. So they started with rats and then up to primates. And so far, here's the pattern that seems to have developed. During the first trimester of pregnancy, there's a series of things that occur. And hormones not only motivate us 
to do a variety of things, including to be sexually aroused, but hormones also organize our brain. Okay? So an XY male with this testosterone determining factor will have higher levels of, of androgens, testosterone sort of chemicals, as his brain is developing. The first stage in the first, and this happens very early, is sexual orientation. It's been found in rats to primates that if you raise the androgen levels during this time, that the male will be more likely to be attracted as an adult to females. If you lower the androgen levels quite dramatically, as happens under stress, that this male will be more likely to be attracted to other males. So if you have higher, let's see, if you have lower testosterone at this point equals attracted to males. So at least there seems to be some biological factor in homosexual development. We certainly don't know the whole picture, but we know lots of pictures beginning to take place. The second step in this prenatal development of the brain is aggressiveness. In a male with regular levels of testosterone during this early trimester of the fetal brain development, he will tend to be more aggressive than his female counterpart as an adult. If he has significantly lowered levels of testosterone during this period, he will be uh, less aggressive. So now you've got the possibility of having a heterosexual male who's aggressive, or a heterosexual male who's not aggressive, or a homosexual male who's not aggressive, the stereotype, but what about all those homosexual males who are in biker bars beating the crap out of people? You can have homosexual males who are highly aggressive as well. It starts to explain some things. Number three, the third level, is brain specialization. Without going into a lot of detail here, male-female brains start out exactly the same and during fetal brain development differ quite dramatically. Women get quite better at verbal tasks on average. Males get better on average at three-dimensional tasks. Women's brains physically have more connection of the corpus callosum, the brain nerve tissue between the left and right brain. Um, lots of things like that we can go into. But m if you have high levels of testosterone, the brain specialization tends to be male, meaning that the left brain for right-handed people is dominant, and uh, the person probably will be superior at, at 3D type activities. If, the, if you have low levels of androgens at that point, the brain specialization will be more generalized, it'll be a more f typical female type brain, and one of the things that the female type brain is better at doing, for example, is multitasking. We have experimental evidence that shows if you give 20 minutes to the average male to get six tasks done, you give 20 minutes to the average female to get six tasks done, she'll be much more likely to get far more done. Uh, we tend to get lost. We tend to specialize and burrow in on things, and they tend to be able to be able to do a variety of things. Does this mean every male and every female? No, that would be a stereotype. It's just saying the average male versus the average female. And then finally, a couple more things happen here. Uh, another stage that happens during brain development is dealing with the endocrine system. Part of it determines whether a person has a period or not, for example, obviously. Number five, the very last stage of this uh, brain development, fetal brain development, is other gender typical behaviors. All right, now let's kind of summarize the main point here. Margaret Mead did some powerful research. It was done in a research method that is very open to bias. But clearly, we do find variation throughout the world between male-female behaviors. Not always the same everywhere, although there's probably more patterns that are in common between cultures than Margaret Mead realized. Uh, but when we look at recent research that's done on an experimental method, which is a more reliable method, you can measure brain differences, you can do things of that nature, you can have all kinds of tests, we begin to find that there seem to be average differences between males and females in some behaviors. Now this should not be used to talk about one group being smarter than the other. We both score the same on IQ test, about the same, we may have different specialties. Uh, it shouldn't be used to question one's political abilities or anything of that nature. It shouldn't be used to question equality, but being equal does not mean being exactly the same. And the research is beginning to pile up that not only do we have cultural influences on gender behavior, but there are clearly some very strong biological influences on gender behavior as well.